So, uh, everybody, um, as with all of the sessions yesterday, we will have a discussion section at the end. So we'll have all three papers and then we'll all gather with questions and discussions. If you have any questions to ask any or all of the panellists, could you please ideally use the chat function? Um, that's the easiest one to use. Rather than Q&A, use the chat function, which you'll find at the right hand side of your screen. And ideally, if possible, could you please set the uh, set the menu to set to send to all panelists rather than just the host. That means that regardless of who is chairing the particular session, you will be able to, um, or the the chair will be able to read the questions. So looking forward to some good discussion a little later on. But before that, we have our three papers. So first of all, I would like to welcome Simon Clark, who is a senior lecturer at Shetland College in archaeology. So um, over to you, Simon. OK, thank you. So uh, my paper is titled uh, Time, Space Ge and Gender at Skatnes Brock Village, uh, which is a, an Iron Age site in the south of Shetland. Well, if I just just wait it to move on. Um, so this this is a, a a huge excavation that was was conducted between 1995 and 2006, uh, for the most part, uh, and has actually just finished uh, being published. Really, there was a fantastic series of three major publications, edited by Steve Dockrell, Julie Bond, and Val Turner. That they're the series editors, and there's a cast of thousands that was involved in the actual excavation and individual specialisms within the within the investigation of the site. So this, I don't want to give the impression that this is in any way my data, in one sense. Um, as I say, it's, it's very thoroughly documented. Uh, Steve Dockrell is uh, absolutely a meticulous excavator uh, and recorder of uh, the physical remains of archaeology, which is obviously the evidence that we work with. Um, if there was to be a minor criticism of uh, the series, is that it, it slightly lost uh, focus on what I think should be the main feature of, of archaeology, which is that although we investigate the past through material culture, the focus should always be people. Uh, and it does, there's a little bit of it, sort of every lens of gravel and sand and, and peat ash has been sort of discussed in microscopic detail. Um, and there, there is discussion of society within that, but it does it does get kind of hidden amongst the incredible detail of the actual physical remains. So what I'm going to try and do today is think about what this meant in terms of um, social relations and, and power relations and, and contact between individuals uh, and between communities and households uh, within this society. Um, so that's a little a little disclaimer at the beginning. I should also say that in trying to identify gender within archaeology, we're on a bit of a sugarly peg to put things mildly. It's important to emphasize that although we used to try and identify male and female activities and male act male and female areas within archaeological sites, we now recognize that very often, uh, gendered activity, though it's an important structuring factor within society, very often that is segregated um, temporally rather than spatially within archaeological sites. And when you're looking at a site which is occupied for more than a thousand years, just for the Iron Age phase of the site, uh, trying to work out what happened sort of one Wednesday afternoon uh, as to distinguish it from what happened in the morning or what happened later in the year, is extremely difficult. There are definitely cyclical pipe um, um, activities within the site, but they're, they're, they're quite difficult, obviously, to disentangle uh, archaeologically from the available evidence. Um, as I say, the site is meticulously uh, recorded, uh, but necessarily simplified in terms of how it's, it's tried to capture this complexity. Um, and in particular, I'd like to emphasize that the, 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 the phasing of the site into, well, it's divided into six phases uh, within uh, the publication, but almost the whole of a, a sort of thousand year pe period basically divides between three. Um, the phase four, phase five, and phase six of the settlement is about a thousand years. 
and so many the, the these this broad categorization of the site into three into these three iron age phases is actually a gross simplification and uh, it's it's going to be a lot more complicated than that what we were what we're what we're looking at the other thing to say is that th that um, the excavation report has tended to atomize things into individual buildings uh, again this is necessary from a from a descriptive point of view but it does mean that it's very difficult to see how the settlement as a whole actually held together uh, and and how it, even individual households within the community actually functioned so what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to be trying to drill down to in today's session, really. And the first thing I want to emphasize is that when we think about a community, it's often useful to think not in terms of individual buildings, but in terms of um, compounds. And so the starting point really for understanding the Iron Age phase of Scatness is to think about the enclosing ditch and rampart, which actually defines the settlement. And this is a, a, a huge feature which receives almost no attention whatsoever in, in, in the presentation of the site today. It's been completely backfilled and is hardly even referenced in the signage uh, at the site. Um, and it, it's, it's a very small part of the excavation as well. Uh, I was actually involved in this. This is less than two meters wide, but just a little bit, of, I think about a meter and 20 centimeters wide, this trench. Um, and the ditch that this represents is about 200 meters long. So we've we've excavated less than 1% of the enclosing ditch, uh, but it would have been actually the dominating feature of the site when it was in, uh, when it was originally constructed. It's eight meters wide, it's stone lined on both the inner face and outer face of the ditch. It's three meters deep, and it would have had a correspondingly massive rampart just within uh, that within the, the circuit of the uh, of the ditch itself. So this would have been an absolutely enormous communal undertaking to create this. It's obviously defensive. It's actually about the same size as a legionary fortress ditch, if you can believe that. But it's obviously it's, it's created by a much smaller community. Uh, so the, the labor involved in creating this, those of you that have done any dry stone walling or ditch digging, is 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 absolutely mind boggling. Uh, and must have involved the the uh, a huge proportion of society. So certainly men, women, and children digging out this ditch uh, and and collecting the stone to actually uh, line it and and build up the rampart front and the breastwork. Um, so actually more stone than is involved in the brock itself at the settlement. So we don't think of it as being the main problem, kind of monumental feature, but it actually would have been in, enormously important to the, the the site's identity. And rather than focusing on its defensive characteristics, it's also worth saying that it's enormously important in terms of defining the community, uh, se separating the insiders and the outsiders, and controlling uh, the community as well, controlling access uh, to, 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 to the people inside the community and controlling their labor and so on. So this would have been a really important uh, controlling uh, as well as uh, defining feature for for the uh, for the settlement, and it deserves a little bit more attention than it's received in the publication. I think, uh, although the details all there, it's just a question of digging for it. So there was actually also a geophysics ex um, survey that was done of the site, uh, which gives us a little bit more information about the extent and character of the uh, defensive line. Um, so this, for those of you that aren't familiar with geophysics. Uh, this probably won't make a great deal of sense, but in this instance, what we've got here is a, a resistivity range. Um, so it's measured in ohms, and what you've got is a high resistivity uh, feature, which is the dark, and low resistivity, which is the uh, which is the light coloured features. Uh, and basically, the ditch is sharp as lighter coloured features and and midden fills and things like that. So we, what we've got is a major ditch running round through here. With a gap in it, which is probably uh, a, a, an entrance way into the enclosure, we didn't actually, unfortunately, get to excavate that. Um, so uh, Steve Docker actually also thought there was potentially another entrance way just here, on the basis of the alignment of the uh, the Brock entrance uh, and the, the entrance ways of, of some of the major houses. Uh, but there's no actual physical evidence for that, and of course, we, most of the the uh, enclosure. Has not been investigated either, even by geophysics, but certainly not by excavation. These little coloured-in areas are the tiny bits of 
the ditch, the upper part of the ditch, which were identified. Uh, so we do, we have a reasonable idea of the extent uh, of, of the enclosure. We, we know of the position of one of the entranceways, and it's likely that the number of entranceways was limited. As there, could, there may have only been one. I would be surprised if there were more than two entranceways into the interior of this, this complex. Uh, and very possibly just one, even major hill forts like Danbury, for example, uh, for much of their, their, their sequence only have a single entranceway. It's obviously, it's a, it's a point of, uh, of, of weakness, but also um, it's when you're, when you're having relations with external groups, it's often uh, desirable to actually control the way they see you and control the way they have access to you uh, to a single particular sort of vantage point. Okay. Moving on, contemporary with the construction of that initial uh, in, uh, enclosure ditch is the Baroque itself, which sat in the centre of the uh, of the enclosure. And although there were probably some other minor features that are con contemporary with it, it sits initially in splendid isolation. It's a Baroque tower sitting in the centre of the enclosure. Um, as I say, probably with its entrance way, its main entrance way on the western side. There is a second entrance way, which we believe was actually only uh, in operation uh, during the uh, construction phase of the site. It's, it blocked fairly early in the sequence of the uh, of the Brock's life, we think. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with with Brock's, uh, they they are uh, they're regarded as defendable towers. They're really fortified farm houses um, rather than castles. There are about well somewhere between seventy and one hundred and fifty of them. In Shetland, uh, most of them have not been investigated thoroughly, so you can't be absolutely certain until you see particular architectural features. Uh, but these um, these um, are uh, very substantial houses uh, with intramural staircases, scarcement ledges, uh, and multi multiple floors. At least one timber floor in the interior, which would have been probably the main uh, residence uh, within the within the building. Um, about 100 years after the Brock is built, additional buildings are added. I'm going to have to start racing through this because I'm starting to get behind my schedule. Um, you've got uh, two large wheelhouses that are constructed. Um, the key things to say about them really are is that they start to form a barrier across the interior of the enclosure, uh, suggesting that we might actually have had a, an anti-clockwise circulatory pattern from the from the gateway round the Brock and to the entranceways of these this group of houses, they all have doorways on the same side, um, and that's probably for symbolic reasons. And the fact that the doorways are all 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 on the same alignment, probably uh, together with the, the relatively massive scale of these houses, suggests they're actually of a similar status to the Brock itself. They're not they're inferior, but they're not grossly inferior in social status. Uh, you can see. This one, this is wheelhouse 14. It's kind of misshapen because it's squished in between the, the rampart and the, the other houses that it's, it's kind of competing for space with. Um, but they're both um, basically wheelhouses. They've got these uh, extraordinary piers, which again would have supported uh, probably partly corbelled roofing, but also partly wooden suspended floors for additional accommodation within the interior. So again, another point of similarity with the, with the Brocks. So these are these are themselves quite monumental houses, uh, with uh, the, the main architectural focus being the central space with a hearth, uh, and then these piers, um, with which are separated from the outer wall. And actually, the the stonework is kind of polished between the wall and the end of the pier, where people have squeezed round. So that would have actually been an important circulatory route uh, within the building, presumably for lower status people or people trying to squeeze in round the back of people sitting around the fireplace. And both of the houses have got the same circulatory pattern. The architecture forces you to circulate around the building, again, in an anti-clockwise circulatory way, which suggests the fact that you've got that similarity between the, the overall compound and the, and the two houses that we've been able to investigate the interior of actually suggests that there is quite a strong pattern, uh, repeating social practice going on in these houses. So similarity and a relative equality between these households in these, this early phase. Um, later on, we start to get more irregular buildings being squeezed in. There are actually other houses that we've only partially investigated. Um, but you can see that there's, this is effectively a sort of a, um, um, 
a sort of a lean-to structure that's created in, 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 internally between the gaps between the Baroque and these, this, these other group of wheelhouses. Um, so what we see over time is that the houses become less equal in terms of their architectural features and their standing probably within the community. So this is, this is that house, this is house 22. This is also, the other thing to say about this is it's actually connected to the other houses by a series of crawl ways. This is slightly exaggerated. This, this, this protective modern floor that's been put down has, has lowered the, the apparent height of the doorway, but it would always have been a squeeze, to put it mildly, to get between these spaces. So these are not, uh, these are not grand entrances between, between residences. These are very much spaces that you you'd scramble through or you kind of pass resources through. Um, but what it suggests is that this this this, this particular shared space is, is is probably a communal workspace. Some of the, the uh, plant macro fossils uh, found in the excavation deposits also suggest this was heavily involved in in crop processing, um, cereals, uh, but also um, um, flax, which primarily would have been used for for textile manufacture. Okay, so this is probably a shared space between these the major houses. It may well have been used as a residence for lower status people as well. So you might have estate workers or slaves actually living within their working space. One of the things I need to emphasize is that the the um, the houses are not uh, cannot simply be taken as representative of of, of households or um, uh, or families. Structure 12 is a very good example of that. What you've got here is uh, the building actually being reorientated uh, in its later history. So it goes from being uh, a high status residence with its entrance to the west to actually be pro becoming probably an ancillary structure to the Baroque itself with its entrance moved to the eastern side and a passageway connecting it to, the, to, the, to just in front of the Baroque entrance. Uh, and it actually also gets this um, specialist food processing um, lean to structured on one side, which has got the famous um, the the, uh, the stove structure, uh, which you can just see here with this uh, this stoke hole. Uh, so it's a sort of an oven or stove or or stove structure, which has been uh, it's just quite unique within the within the complex. It's probably a specialist uh, food preparation area, and it's suggested that this might have actually been a feasting area. Uh, in the uh, the, the um, later part of the Middle Iron Age. The Baroque itself is also being modified uh, as we go through time. We get these uh, piers added to the interior uh, and we get structures added to the approach to the Baroque, um, including this one here. This, this cell is actually potentially a guard cell effectively. So whereas early Baroques have guard cells within the intramural wall, it's possible that this guard cell has been added later on and is carrying out essentially the same social function, but controlling now entrance to the Brock and also to this feasting area with its ancillary food production uh, facilities. Um, later again, we actually see the interior is completely choked now with buildings. Um, the, the original wheelhouses go out of use. The, the Brock itself also goes out of use eventually. But what you're seeing is a series of buildings blocking the interior completely. A new high status residence is added on this side, again with its entranceway towards the west. The fact that it's built against the Brock probably means that it's actually trying to appropriate the status of a now defunct but still standing um, major building um, at the heart of the settlement. Um, what we can also say is that the, the defences have also gone out of use by this point. Um, so the settlement is becoming open, um, but in other respects, uh, there is a good deal of continuity. You've still got these raised wooden floors in the highest status buildings. Timber would have been very expensive, of course. Um, and But what it means is these people literally see themselves as above everybody else. That, that raising up is actually to do with status as much as anything. Um, so the, 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 the remains that we see um, you know, divide the building into two, and it'd be very tempting to suggest that that was male and female halves, but I think that's false. The main event is actually at the next level, uh, and we can tell that's high status because through the cracks of the floorboards, they're dropping all sorts of expensive things, amber, um, um, amber beads, fragments of glass from Roman imports, 
um, things like that. So this is a high status residence, no longer defensive, but still multi-story as the Brock had been. Um, in some respects, it's actually more architecturally complex than the building that, would, that, that had gone before. You've got these staircases. Um, the staircase to the outside at the second floor level. So you've got actually a really complicated pattern of access and communication within the settlement. The space has actually become in some ways more architecturally complex, um, but, but less outwardly monumental. Um, so a key thing that I need to say towards the end of the settlement's Iron Age phase, we see a shift away from monumentality uh, of the building uh, more of an emphasis on um, uh, portable wealth. Uh, there's a big cache of um, uh, bronze and silver casting waste. Um, that's probably actually a deliberate act uh, of caching that material rather than simply waste. Uh, it may well be, uh, you know, commemorating actually the event of, of casting and giving out these, these beautiful prizes to followers. Uh, and to friends, uh, literally forging relationships with the community. So there's a change in the way power is being exercised. It's going from architecture to portable wealth as we move through time uh, in the Iron Age. And the architecture itself, in some ways, becomes rather less impressive. The Pictish period architecture is essentially subterranean, which in some ways is a much more sensible way of keeping out of the wind putting itself on a platform in the sky is actually a pretty expensive exercise, both in terms of construction and also heating. Um, so this is a, this is a, in some, in some sense, is a return to sort of the sensible way of doing things in Shetland. Uh, but what it also represents is, um, is, a, is a hiding of that architectural quality. There's still distinctions between better and worse built structures. Um, this Pictish period cellular structure is beautifully constructed but you've got to be internally, you've got to be internal to the building before you can see that quality. So it's, 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 not, it's not broadcasting its importance to the hoi polloi anymore. It's only the invited guest that actually sees that importance. Um, so the way the architecture is being used, as well as the amount of effort that's being invested in architecture changes over time. Um, again, it's important that we, we, we don't, straightforwardly associate uh, buildings with a single function. This is the, the so-called Pictish smithy, again, a, 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 a sunken structure. Um, but we now know that it's, it's not really a smithy. It's, it's an anthropogenic house, which has a, possibly has a phase of, of smithing associated with it. But actually, um, this would have, th th these buildings would have been multifunctional. They would have gone through cycles of being male spaces and female spaces and, and domestic. And, uh, and, and industrial production spaces, probably in the cycle of a single day, actually, uh, but certainly over the course of a, of a season. Um, the other thing to say is that these spaces are becoming more segregated and more private, whereas the Baroque interior and the wheelhouses interior, you, if you stood in the centre, you could pretty much see everybody in the household. These, these later buildings have much more private space. Um, and they're much more irregular. I think that's something that I'd really like to emphasize that's not really been picked up before. Whereas in the early settlement at Scatness, you can kind of anticipate how space is going to be used uh, within, the, certainly between the two big wheelhouses. Uh, in the pictures period, every house is different. The, 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 the orientation of the doorways is different. Uh, and there's all these kind of interesting nooks and corners and crannies. So you would have needed specialist knowledge. You would have needed to have been an insider to know how to navigate this community. If you were a guest, you would need to be, you'd need to be shown the way. And I think that's probably not unrelated to the fact that the settlement has become open. So it's become more open, more permeable in one sense, but those guests to the site now need to be led by the hand much more, uh, much, much more actively than they would have been before. Uh, we are coming to the end. So if you're starting to get a little bit nervous, sorry about that. Um, just the final thing really to, to say about the, uh, the, the um, Iron Age period is its extraordinary longevity. This, is, uh, this wheelhouse is actually built in the first century um, AD, uh, but doesn't go out of use until the early Viking period, uh, the, the ninth century. 
it's it's rebuilt multiple times its last floor actually seals viking period fine so it's absolutely securely in the viking period and it's gone from being uh, a relatively high status pictish space probably with a, a, a decorated orthostat possibly this one or this one and this pictish symbol stone of the bear is actually that stone there in the, in the picture uh, so it's been put face down and that's either been concealed by the pictish residents to stop it from being defaced or it's been actually defaced by the vikings a bit difficult to say which but the, the, you've got this extraordinary survival of architecture but kind of masking the fact that you've actually got enormous social upheavals going on the the the, the, the there is a there is a incredible complexity and wealth to the architecture of this site um which has sort of concealed the the uh, or or, or uh, stopped us from talking about adequately uh, the, the the very real trends in uh, in behavior at the site i'm going to skip the next slide and just go to the go to the conclusion um so the things I really want to emphasize is that the, the, um, we go from uh, an early Iron Age uh, set up with at least two major wheelhouses in Obrock, which have a degree of equality and a, and a degree of similarity in the way space is being used between these different households. Um, later on, we see uh, increasingly, increasing uh, divergence and diversity uh, between the statuses and the, the way these spaces are being used. Um, and we also see um, uh, changes to the status of the settlement as a it goes from being a defended settlement uh, to being an open settlement, um, which uh, at one level probably does imply that there's the lower levels of, uh, of insecurity, but actually is probably much more importantly to do with the permeability of the settlement uh, and how it's defining itself against the wider community. Um, and we, we, at the same time, we see uh, a shift to, away from monumentality towards hidden complexity. Uh, and, and, and I think that what actually that means is that you're moving from statuses of households to power and status being vested much more on individuals. Uh, I hesitate to say whether those individuals are male or female, uh, but I suspect that this is not a good story from the point of view of uh, male power, male female power relations. This, this may very well be that you're starting to get a less equal society in terms of gender relations, but certainly in terms of other types of relations, uh, class relations and, and between elders and uh, junior members of society. And I'll, I'll call it a day at that, I think. Apologies for running over. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating discussion there and delighted to see one of my favourite Pictish uh, carvings appearing there, uh, the bear carving. Um, could I get you to stop sharing your screen and then I will pass the presenter role over to Andrew. Wonderful, thank you very much. And um, looking forward to some discussion coming out of um, your paper assignment in a few minutes when we get back to the discussion session. Just a reminder to everybody um, to please type your questions into the chat uh, function on the right hand side of your screen and uh, send messages to all panellists. And uh, without further ado, let's move on now to Andrew's paper. Thank you, Oshin. So, 20 minutes from now. So, um, the origins of this talk go back a few years, uh, when Brian Smith, our Shetland archivist, sent me material he'd collected about an obscure 15th century Shetlander called Olaus Pauper, or Poor Olaf, whose claim to fame is that he wrote a long Latin poem which has never been translated into English and so has languished in obscurity. Brian was keen to have it translated, so my wife Alexis, who's a retired principal teacher of classics, was allotted this task. And I was given the much less challenging job of interpreting some of his allusions, and it's still a work in progress. The poem has only appeared in print three times, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> Firstly, in 1802, in the annual Anniversaria, published by Copenhagen University. And this text was prepared by this gentleman here um, and commented on by Erasmus Nierup, who was a leading Danish antiquarian in his day. We don't actually know why he chose this particular poem to publish, because he's not entirely <coughs> complimentary about it. 
but there must be a story here. In his introductory notes, Nierup criticises the language of the poetry for being rather harsh and the prose sections for using unfamiliar vocabulary. But he says this is a problem not of the author, but of the age in which literature had almost died out and barbarism had flooded the lands far and wide. Alexis doesn't agree with this view at all, and apart from a surfeit of whining and moaning, albeit justifiable in the harrowing circumstances mentioned in his poem, which seem to have caused him post-traumatic stress disorder, she finds the Latin smooth, accurate, sincere, and compelling in its drama. There are 314, I don't know, 14, goodness, 314 lines of total, uh, in total, subdivided into sections, with 238 lines of elegiac couplets and 76 lines of prose. Now, Nierup is also famous for his role in the establishment of Copenhagen Museum, so he's quite a, a figure in Danish antiquarianism. His edition of the poem appeared again in Denmark in the Scriptores Rerum Danicarum Medii Ivii, volume 8 in 1834, which very few have read. And as far as Scotland is concerned, W.C. Trevelyan published a selection um, of 66 of its 314 lines in the journal Archaeologica Scotica in 1831, making some of the poem available to a Latin literate a Scottish audience. Both Nierup and Trevelyan had access to a manuscript copy of a copy of the poem originally transcribed by Professor Thomas, uh, transcribed for Professor Thomas Bartolin, the Danish royal antiquarian, by the famous Icelandic scholar Árni Magnusson, who you see in that picture there. Um, the actual original seems to have been lost in the great Copenhagen fire of 1728, which damaged so many of Artney's priceless documents. Luckily, two 15th century manuscript copies have survived in Germany. One exists in the town of Wolfenbüttel, in the renowned Herzog August Library, and another, the one on the right, um, survives in a library in Augsburg. However, there isn't actually a very great difference textually between all three copies, although the challenge comes from deciphering three very different writing styles. Now, you might wonder why I tell you about the, uh, the history of the poem itself. Well, it's quite interesting if you're interested in manuscript dissemination. However, if you want to know about Olaus himself, the poem is the main source of information about him, because he includes a lot of biographical material throughout, although it's a bit sketchy. For example, he tells us he's from Shetland, although he left as a boy. So here we go. Hunk Hetland Genuit, sed per tempus brevi pawit, hank quia dum liquit, membra tenella tulit. So all right, I won't be reading out all the Latin uh, quotes that we've got, but I thought we could have a, a little bit there. So Shetland gave him his birth, but nourished him for only a short time, because until he left it, he bore tender limbs. Strangely, he was speaking in the third person at that particular point. The poem itself isn't um, just a, a biographical description of, um, of his life. It's actually a praise poem dedicated to Bishop Jens Pedersen Jarnschek of Roskilde. And here's a bit of onomastic flattery. Uh, Roskilde doesn't actually take its name uh, from roses, but uh, it sounds like roses in, in Latin. So, Bishop of Roskilde, I will celebrate you in verse, although I may not be worthy to describe you. You trace your famous name from the Fountain of Roses, i.e. because you're called Bishop of Roskilde, and Roskilde in Latin, in Danish, sounds like Fons Rosarum, and from that state you choose your name. He's actually quite interested in names, as we'll, we'll see. Um, and if you're interested in what Roskilde actually means, it's from a, an Old Norse ma ma male name, so it's something like Roars, um, um, uh, not fountain, but um, well, roars well, we'll say that. Okay? So it's nothing to do with roses. He continues in his praise of Bishop Jens. You become gentle to the wretched, very harsh to the arrogant. 
You are magnificent and also generous with gifts. You are not warlike nor quarrelsome, but in everything you are a cultivator of peace and of noble spirit, exactly what a churchman should be. Many kings and refined dukes honour you, and military ornaments also decorate you. And because my muse is not strong enough to describe your great deeds, I hang back from this and I rein myself in. Okay. So he spends a lot of time in the poem um, phrasing this Bishop of Roskilde. And he tells us that he wrote the poem on Michaelmas, which is the 29th of September, 1448. Um, you see, he tells us that he was in Erfurt, which is in Germany. Now, Erfurt, uh, the university there was founded in 1379. It was the oldest university in Germany, and a number of Nordic churchmen went there to study. And later on, it's famous because it was the alma mater of a certain Martin Luther. Okay. So we'll get back to the biographical elements of the poem now. Um, he says 16 years earlier, he left Shetland for Orkney. So 16 years before he wrote his poem. He left Shetland for Orkney to go to the cathedral school in Kirkwall. And he must have shown academic potential for this to be arranged. And presumably, it was expected that he would return to serve in the Shetland Archdeaconry. For at the start of the tender years of my age, namely in the year of our Lord 1432, on account of study, taken from a harbour of peacefulness and led down into the depths of the sea, I entrusted myself completely to Orkney in my ship. But assuredly the opportunity of returning to my own land had been completely denied to me thus far. He tells us that two years after he had arrived in Orkney, he attempted to return to Shetland. And he got close enough to see the islands but couldn't land because the ship was caught in a sudden storm, which lasted for four days, he tells us. And it blew him and the crew over to Jutland, so right across the North Sea. And he gives a graphic account of the storm, his terror, the fact he has to eat raw pork and drink seawater, and his shipwreck. He believes they're shipwrecked because of the sins of those on the ship, which he doesn't go into, and that it's the will of God. So there we go. It's a very um, evocative description of the storm. Sometimes the ship appeared to be on the peaks of sea mountains gushing forth so that there would be no hope of descent for me. And while we plunged into Caribbean chasms, alas, grief, we are rolled in the maw of Scylla. Hence it is, when we seek the consolations of land sighted, we suffer shipwreck and we are shaken by the waves. And that land was called Utia in Latin. So Utia is Jutland. Once shipwrecked in Utia, he's eventually taken into servitude in a castle. And he's especially stressed because um, he can't understand the language of the people on the beach. This is rather odd, given he was surely a Norse speaker. And the inhabitants of Jutland, although they have a distinct dialect, should have been comprehensible. Unless, of course, he's initially met by Frisian speakers who um, exist in southern uh, Jutland. And his first job at the castle is as a swineherd. So there's um, he has a terrible experience on the sea and initially has a terrible experience on land as well. So while a boy among strangers, like a sheep not knowing how to talk, I am sacrificed not knowing their language. The people of the castle receive me into someone's care, we don't know who this is, and put in charge of the pigs with their pasture. One of the things that stands out from the poem is that he takes pride in his Shetland identity. And um, he will come, oh sorry, yeah, we'll jump ahead a bit. Um, before we go on to that, um, he actually tells us, I suppose, uh, a sort of joke. Um, he's promoted while at the kitchen um, from being a swineherd uh, to being a pot washer. And we get uh, a sort of onomastic joke here. Here, His name, Olaf, in the original, Olawus, in Latin, uh, he interprets as Olas Lawans, or pot washer. And uh, he tells us that he's very frustrated at this time also because he can't get access uh, to any books. He's just treated as this um, 
yeah, general dog's body. Um, while he's acting as a pot washer and cook, he tells us that he was so exhausted and stressed that his, his hair turned white overnight. So there we go. So it's, it was even worse than being at sea. So to get back to the bit, I jumped ahead. Um, as I said, he takes pride in his Shetland identity. And um, one of the things that he gives us is this fascinating folk tale, which uh, explains the origin of the name Shetland. Now, he says that it comes from the word for a sword hilt. So, moreover, my hereditary name is Hethelandinus, indeed Hiltland, as I conjecture, received its name from the piece of iron separating the sword in the manner of a cross, i.e. a hilt, long ago, as I have learned from the teaching of the ancestors, between Norway and my native land, that is Hetlandia, once there was situated a fertile land called Svertland, considering itself indeed to Shetland just like a sword to its hilt. But the ocean covered over that land with salt marshes, so that no area was henceforth left for human habitation. Indeed, the destruction of this was a great indication of my future calamity. Okay, he always turns things back on his own uh, situation. Now, the name is fascinating here, although there are different spellings. One seems to be the, the Latin uh, version, but when he talks about Hjeltland, he's showing that um, the, there was a, a Shetland version of this uh, name, which also occurs in the Icelandic sagas, i.e. Hjeltland, so the, the, the land of the, the hilt or Hiltland. Now, weirdly, some geologists tell us that at the end of the last ice age, there might well have been an island between Shetland and Norway, where the Viking bank fishing grounds are today. Now, I'm not saying there's any link at all between the two, but it's just a fascinating um, sort of uh, analogy there from, from the folk, uh, folk tale. Now, his word Sverkland is interesting too, because this is just the Old Norse Sverdland or Swordland. So, so this seems to be an actual folk tale that must have been current uh, in Shetland at the time. His experiences at sea and as a servant remained with him and it seems that he suffered from PTSD and these lines perfectly demonstrate Olawas's elegiac couplets using hexameter in one line and pentameter in the next and they also include some typical and effective stylistic features, including alliteration, wordplay, and onomatopoeia. Um, so, if I manage to sleep at night, I'm terrorized by countless forbidding dangers, for I seem to be carried flying through the air. Now the sky crackles with flames, now I'm submerged in the waters, I toss and turn in bed. I heave sighs and I beat myself with my palms, often lying in tears. So, again, a very vivid piece of imagery. Although he gives us details like this of his suffering, he doesn't tell us how he manages to escape from the kitchen or how he ended up at Erfurt. But he thanks a certain Canon Jakob of Roskilde for being a supportive master and is grief stricken when he dies. And he, he is also helped by Bishop Jens, who treats him like a foster son. Now, um, sadly, his poem never actually reached Bishop Jens because um, he discovered that Bishop Jens had actually died two weeks before he completed it. But it took a little while for that news to percolate from Denmark down to Erfurt. So what do we know about Olavus then? Um, we have the information in the poem, and we also actually have a little more uh, material that we can add to his biography because his name has been identified in a list of the graduates at Erfurt University. So we know that he was awarded his Baccalaureus Artium, his BA in 1444, and his Masters in 1447. So there was a little bit of a happy ending uh, there. But we know he must have been born at some point in the 1420s, because he's a young boy, it appears, when he leaves Shetland. Still a young boy when he lands in um, Jutland. Um, so, uh, the, from the 1440s, so he's in his um, sort of late 20s, early 30s by the time he becomes a, a master. 
and then he writes his poem in 1448. So here's a map of Olaus's travels or travails, if you like. Um, so starts off in Shetland, goes to Orkney, almost makes it back to Shetland, is taken across the sea to Jutland, um, finds himself uh, somehow or other in Erfurt. He's um, uh, has this connection with Roskilde and ultimately he ends up in Copenhagen. So there's quite a, um, a wide sort of area that is associated you know, with his life. Some of the built heritage from his time still survives. So I always thought it might be interesting just to actually visit these places, um, maybe to put, put together a small booklet or something uh, like that with some, some, some photographs of some of these uh, medieval structures. So I said um, Copenhagen as well, I put Copenhagen on the map. Now the reason for that is that he turns up one last time in 1472. Well, we can assume that it is him because it's uh, Olaf the Shetlander who's being referred to. And this is um, a letter which is sent from the Archbishop of Trondheim, um, a letter of thanks uh, to um, Olaf of Shetland. And it's um, thanking him for looking after an expensive gift of money and a, a, a jewel for King Christian I. And in return, he's given a noble, which is a valuable gold coin as payment, which seems to demonstrate that he is uh, now has a, is highly respected and is a trusted figure um, in the church. So not bad for a shipwrecked swineherd and pot washer. And incidentally, when he was born, Shetland was part of the Kingdom of Norway. And when he died post 1472, Shetland was part of the Kingdom of Scotland. So he's a very interesting um, lifespan at uh, a very important period in Shetland history. So in conclusion, how should we evaluate the writer and his work? Well, the text is written in classical not medieval Latin, which is a plus, I would say. It's grammatically flawless. He composed his poem in elegiac couplets, the first line in hexameter, the second in pentameter, in the classical style, so he knew what he was doing. His expertise in Latin shows signs of the influence of the sixth century Latin grammarian Priscianus and his Institutes of Grammar, which was the standard Latin textbook in the Middle Ages. So he's clearly um, undertaking um, you know, the best education in, at the time. Um, he also refers in his text to the Labyrinthus, which was also known as the Miserius Rectorum Scholarum, which was a critical treatise on poetry by Eberhard of Beethoven, a 13th century Flemish grammarian, so he's clearly proud of the, uh, the, the, the text that he's read. He's aware of Boethius, a 5th or 6th century Roman senator, as a kindred spirit, and has obviously studied his Consolation of Philosophy, which was one of the most influential works in the Middle Ages. He mentions a Henricus Pauper, other known, otherwise known as Henry of Settimello, a late 12th, 12th century Italian poet, author um, of uh, a text, the Diversitate Fortunae et Philosophiae Consolatione, which is a long poem in elegiac couplets. And there's some clear echoes of this in Olawus's work, not the least uh, being his title, Olawus Pauper. He's very familiar with Greek and Roman literature and mythology, which he incorporates in his text to great effect. So he's very well educated. He's had the best education that um, was available at the time. He's a, a, a very uh, skillful uh, poet. Um, and he's also uh, a successful churchman, which the 1472 letter uh, would suggest. And the fact that he composed this poem in 1448, when he was still a relatively young man, shows he was a very well-educated, skillful poet, and therefore certainly earns his place in the Shetland literary canon. And I think I'll draw it to do an end there. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was an absolutely fascinating insight into uh, into uh, one individual um, who, as you say, was alive at a fascinating time and certainly had a, an eventful life. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm really, um, really intrigued by, by that text and some of the things that uh, 
that he discusses. I love the uh, the idea of the uh, the lost island. Um, certainly, I, I think I'll I'll be picking your brains about that in the uh, in future, if not to today. Um, but I hopefully have now passed on the presenter role to our next speaker. Um, so we should uh, quickly move on um, to Jack Dice, who. Yeah, excellent. That's fabulous. Um, who is an emeritus professor of Nordic theology uh, at the Scottish United Reformed and Congregational College. So uh, from, as I said, we've started at the Iron Age. We've moved right into the late uh, medieval or rather Renaissance. Uh, and now we're moving right into the present day uh, with modern novels. And so, um, Yes, the floor is yours, Jack. Um, I think, can I just double check that it's not quite coming through for me? Is everybody seeing a sort of notched screen? There he is. Hopefully it'll take just a second. And Yes, maybe try try sharing again, see if that works. And maybe turn off your camera, uh, Jack. Ah, yes. yes. Oh, right. Uh, um, At the bottom of your screen, stop, stop there should be a stop time. video, and that, that will save on your bandwidth. Um, right, I'm not finding that, sorry. Uh, once you put the screen share open, it's actually on the top of the slide. It's the top of the screen for the slide screen. Are you seeing the screen now? The slide now? No. Uh, yes, although there is that. There's there's blocks that we're missing. It's, it's showing okay now for me. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. You're fi you're fine now. You're fine now. So I think <laughs> we, should, we can just go ahead, and that should I, be. Uh, and you can hear me. So yet yeah, can hear you absolutely fine. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> A television adaptation helps us to develop visual memories in our heads so that we see the characters. And very soon the peritext of the published novel's book covers catches up. And so it is with um, uh, the Shetland novels of uh, Anne, Anne Cleves. The central, continuing and charismatic character of Jimmy Perez, played on TV by Dougie Henschel, is a major image displayed, of course, on the front covers of the books. Yet Cleves gives us uh, significant female um, characters, not least in her professional investigators. Willow Reeves, the forensic scientist, Sam Boyd, the DI in Glasgow, Cora McLean, the Lyric GP, but a one-woman forensic team, and Rona Lane, the procurator fiscal, on whom this paper focuses. One might have added DS Tosh McIntosh, but she unfortunately only appears in the TV series, though Cleve says that she wishes she had written uh, the part for her. One might have expected nothing less from Cleves, drawing on her recollections of a generation of very self-contained women, of which, of course, Vera becomes a daughter. Uh, I focus here uh, on uh, the Shetland novels alone, uh, particularly Red Bones and Blue Lightning, but also primarily on Dead Water. I'm not endeavouring to offer literary criticism, nor exploring the theory of agency, nor drawing inferences as to what Cleves intended or meant in the narrative. My interest is in this character, a professional woman. The choices she makes, the context and bounds within which her choices are made, and the responses of others. And I've tried as far as possible to refrain from spoilers, just in case you haven't read the books. But um, what does she do? 
of course, I, Perez found it hard to explain the role of the fiscal to English colleagues. Even Fran couldn't grasp it. But what does she do? Perez always said that she was a cross between a magistrate and a prosecuting lawyer, but Fran didn't even get that. All she understood was that the fiscal was his boss. The role of a procurator fiscal is multifaceted. They're civil servants, but qualified lawyers acting out with political interference, primarily directing the investigation of alleged crime and instructing and working with the police on gathering evidence. This is Rona Lane, the procurator fiscal. She's supervising the police investigation here. The Scottish legal system is different from the English and she'll be involved right through to prosecution. And indeed, they have a responsibility to determine whether or not a prosecution occurs. That will be down to the fiscal. The fiscal would take formal charge of the case. It's not my, that is Perez's decision, that's down to the fiscal. The fiscal's not decided not to proceed with the matter. It's not so much in discovering facts or in putting them together as finding out what they mean. And the fiscal finally acts as prosecutor in court, though here in the investigation stage, detached from the more androcentric elements of adversarial court proceedings. Cleaves and uh, uh, crime fiction. Historically, crime fiction has been a male dominated genre, but today female crime authors dominate the literary crime fiction market with, as you see here, Maya Schull, Kerstin Ekman, Anne Holt, Camilla Leckberg, Lisa Markland, and Ursa Sigurdardottir as significant Roman Nordic authors. Similarly, contemporary leadership spans gender. Crime fiction has flourished in both male and female hands and appeals to both genders. We focus here on a set of novels by Cleves set in Shetland, only part of her crime fiction writing. Cleves had responded um, to the genre's uh, violence and misogyny. She was looking for an antidote to the rise of crime and thriller novels. A friend of hers had dab dubbed it Sado Porn. And Cleves had noticed a rise in the number of increasingly uh, graphic novels sent to her by publishers, hoping for favourable comments for the dust jackets. She wrote, I'm put off by the voyeuristic and uh, uh, highly sexual nature of uh, the writing. I felt queasy when female authors seemed obliged to start their novels with a scene of graphic violence. I never venture into this territory myself. I especially dislike stories with a sympathetic, but I'd often male investigator. It's as if the writer can, uh, sorry, Ocean's covering the screen here, as if the writer can um, uh, do whatever they like, be as pornographically violent as long as the hero tells us how dreadful the crime is and shows us empathy for the victim. Uh, to sell graphic capture, rape, torture, kill novels, Authors have been chucking in strong female characters for balance and have even gained plaudits for highlighting violence against women in the process. And yet rape shouldn't turn us on, but female victimisation uh, sells, asserts Germaine Greer. It seems as if the genre knows only criminalised and medicalised roles for women. But Cleves creates women in investigative roles, from damsel in distress to active agent. And here we have uh, the fiscal Rona Lane in red bones, a cool 50 something with a cutting tongue and a designer wardrobe, which seemed completely out of place in Shetland. Rumour had it that she flew south to Edinburgh every month to visit her hairdresser. Perez never believed Shetland stories, because he, he could almost believe that the blonde hair was natural and the way it was cut took 10 years off her age. 
passion was sailing. She came to Shetland on a yacht from Orkney and had fallen in love with the islands. So Rona Lane is an important person, an important woman in Shetland um, society. A practicing barrister down south and now a Scots advocate and the procurator fiscal at Lerick. Cleve signals her formality, referring to her often as the fiscal or by her full name. Sandy says, everyone in Shetland was in first name terms except the fiscal. Her office is grander than in Perez's police station and she sits behind a large desk. Others defer to her. Referring to her as Jimmy's boss isn't strictly true, but in practice there was an element of hierarchy. While she instructs, other, instructs others' attendants, we are told, I'll make myself available. Her manner is superior, speaking icily, sarcastically. She had an Edinburgh accent, classy Edinburgh, clipped and glacial, putting other people down rather than intimidating them. And she maintains her distance. We hear that she's been invited to speak at a Copenhagen conference. As readers, we may be glad that the author paints something of the character's physical appearance. And Cleves explains to us how Rona looks. Immaculate hair, even at sea on her yacht. Either she had a fantastic haircut or used a serious amount of spray. She dressed very well. A tweed jacket over a cashmere sweater and grey wool trousers. Slim flat shoes that matched in colour exactly. Expensive designer glasses. Of course, the same sartorial investigation is not required with Jimmy Perez, though Cleves has described his te televisual version, Henschel, as delicious. Another of her uh, inventions, uh, Vera, is described by contrast as dowdy. She's not a fashionista, not reliant on lipstick. She's got a brain and she gets the job done. She's not to be written off because she's scruffy and overweight. And the Daily Mail interviewer assures us that the actor Brenda Blethyn has only just swapped her immaculately coiffed hair and beautiful chiffon blouses for a shapeless Mac and her trademark green hat. Ordinarily, uh, Rona complies with the traditional female norm that women and girls should be physically attractive. You are your looks. That's what society tells girls. But Cleve seeks to undermine the implicit equation of professional authority with masculine bodies. In a paper, girls just want to be smart. We're alerted to the double meaning in smart. Clever, but also well presented in appearance. And Lane's appearance is contrasted sharply with that of D.I. Reeves, who arrives as SIO in baggy clothes that offend the obsessively tidy Lane. Rona felt insulted by the lack of care that this woman had taken over her appearance. Hadn't she realised that if women wanted to be successful, they should make some effort? Lane's dress sense may reflect something of both her personal traits and the image and dispositions of her profession. It is, after all, reasonable to expect that lawyers will be meticulous. Lane is tidy, efficient, a stickler. This extends to her home and her boat and her office. Men, of course, are not necessarily less tidy, but there's more to it. Firstly, there may be a, a hint that Rona uh, is not only a fresh professional, but reflects the traits of a good housewife. You may know uh, this image and uh, a text from the 1950s explaining how it's a housewife's duty to keep the house clean. In Deadwater, uh, John Henderson is said to have seen positively the fiscal's compulsive tidiness a sign that he found a kindred spirit. But the term house proud now tends to be used pejoratively to imply that the person is over concerned domestically, over attentive, even obsessive. There is, I think, in the story of Rona Lane, more than a suggestion of a 
of a, an unhealthy uh, obsession with tidiness linked to negative perceptions at her work. We're told that clutter made her uh, physically ill. And isn't there just a, a gender element to the evaluation? Aren't we more inclined to excuse domestic disorder in men and to view negatively domestic orderliness in women? Do we read male thoroughness and adherence to detail and commitment to process as being virtuous? But in women like Rona, tied to over meticulosity, impatience, brusqueness, and excess, female defects impacting negatively on herself. The keeping of a house that's clatty, mock it, reeking, boughten, manky, boggin is a scandalous Scottish uh, allegation. But the resonances are deeper. The sexual term slut is linked to slut's wool, dust or debris or dirt. So Lane's outer cleanliness becomes a front for what is concealed, her affairs. Just as the Shetland rumour mill imagined, she's done something to her hair. Perhaps she's got a new man. There were always rumours. Folk thought all sorts of things about her, and occasionally she caught the tail end of rumours that amused and irritated, that she flew to Edinburgh every six weeks to get her hair done, that she had a child out of wedlock and given him up for adoption, that she had a secret lover who sailed into Eighth Marina after dark most nights and left again in the morning. It was her policy neither to confirm nor deny the stories. But the fiscal is ambitious, not only as a lawyer, but uh, uh, politically as well. She would like to be a member of the Scottish Parliament. Certainly, she would like the power. She didn't intend to be a fiscal in the wilds forever. She'd always had political ambitions, could see herself in the position of power. In her wildest dreams, she imagined a seat in the House of Lords. Baroness Laying of Eighth had a ring to it. And everybody in Shetland knew about Rona Lane's political ambitions. For long, the law has been a key stepping stone into political life. Legal background is a ticket to a seat in Parliament. And Lane had become active with preliminary steps building the relationships she needs. Not feeling the need for friends socially, she creates strong networks of friendship, we're told schmoozing with councillors and politicians. Labelling such activities as networking and making strategic alliances, however, would cast them in a more positive and male light. Her ambitions are scarcely, con scarcely concealed. Discourses uh, about ambition when it's men are often thought vir uh, virtuous. But women's ambition involves deprecating descriptions as unbridled and greedy, ruthlessly ambitious, and the blatantly sexist ash blonde ambition. And for, uh, for Rona, the deprecation comes also in the form of naming. Laying is called the Iron Maiden for a ruthless style and her sp spiky manner, or desiring to be, they say, the Queen Bee for her uh, seeking success in traditionally male areas. And isn't that often so? How common is it for epithets concerning strong women to be negative? Battle axe, Harrod and Virago. This identification of women's power with aggressive or angry behaviour is gendered. They say, when men get angry, their power grows. When women do, it shrinks. A commentator on Linda Fairstein uh, of the Manhattan DA office and herself a, a crime novelist, one wonders whether uh, a male prosecutor would have his drive to succeed and his fashionable appearance mocked in the same way. And of course, there's sometimes a reticence on the part of women uh, to be explicit about their ambitions lest it be seen as egotism, self-aggrandizement, or wanting to be manipulating. 
Better, it seems, to step back foregrounding ambition. What I really wanted to do was not only build a career for myself, but provide my children with the greatest opportunity. And there's something refreshing about the upfront ambition of Rona. She lives up to Jimmy and Sandy's assessment of her as an honest and honourable woman. Perez, but Lane herself, are explicit about the nature of ambition having a large component of power. And there are tensions um, uh, uh, here uh, about the nature of ambition. Sandy says, wonder what the women would make of one another, and smiled at the possibilities of power play. And D.I. Reeves herself returned uh, the fiscal's handshake and wondered why women in power felt the need to play games. Are we to believe that contestation between women, whether around decisions or in rivalry, are somehow more power-focused or controlled or self-serving than those about men? It would appear that men are uh, more upfront about the role influence and power play plays in their careers. But finally, uh, the investigators in contemporary crime fiction are often labelled and bear the traits of anti-heroes, lacking the admirable qualities of the conventional hero. In other words, they're flawed folk. Even Mankell admits about Valander that he dislikes the messily divorced, diabetic, fast food addict that he created. It's said at one point in showing empathy, empathy that Lane's voice was almost human. But of course she is wholly human, a person of intelligence, knowledge and skills, of power and status, of direction and choosing. But she's also flawed like all of us, with secrets, dilemmas and demons. She treats others poorly. She makes choices with harmful consequences. She puts herself first. She uses friends. She places her trust in outward appearance. She closes herself off. She works within the justice system, but she's no crusader for justice. At Shetland Conference, might one well see her as a daughter of Norse women and of Shetlandic crofter women? According to Judith Yes, the sagas are primarily responsible for the widespread view that women in the Viking Age were forceful, independent and powerful. And in more recent times, uh, Lynn Abrams has written of the Shetlandic female crofter was a tough, hard-working and independent woman, and have come to assume a degree of symbolic power. Today, the idealised image of the female crofter woman may be appropriated to provide a powerful and empowering role for women. So, are we to admit Fisco Rona Lane to the pantheon of strong Shetlandic women? The law remains something of a masculine preserve. She persists in her professional life, despite the resistance of male colleagues and the rumour mill. She brings efficiency, persistence, meticulosity, even ruthlessness, while others construe these negatively. She's bold in her ambitions, even if some other folk dislike her for it. She insists on being her own kind of woman. In the hall of strong Shetlandic women, she surely deserves at least a small corner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another absolutely fascinating paper there and uh, a fascinating study on uh, an intriguing character uh, within the novels. And uh, we've got, I would say we can have probably about five minutes uh, of quick uh, question discussion um, and then we can have a 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll be start the next session bang on time at, at half 10. Um, but I, I was uh, wondering, uh, Jack, one of the things that was quite interesting was this um, the relationship of Rona Lang with with Shetland, and and I, I felt that there almost seemed to be a bit of a con a contradiction in play there because as you were closing, the you made the the the, the fascinating comparison as uh, 
of, of the character as a daughter of Norsewoman and um, all of these Shetland <laughs> traits coming on. But um, in her appearance, you've talked about um, or, or quoted the novel in saying it completely out of place in Shetland. And do you think that's a deliberate contradiction in the part of the author there, the fact that um, how comfortably or not the character sits <coughs> within her geographical setting? Well, I mean, I, 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 th I think it's common territory for crime fiction writing um, uh, to, to cast some characters in the role of being the outsider. Uh, and yet, very often, the outsider is the one who is, um, uh, I can't now think of the word, but they, they're the actual one, of, one for the, which the whole thing is pivotal. Um, uh, you know, so they're quite central. Uh, but they use their outlanderness, outlanderness, <laughs> in in order to exercise that uh, agency, uh, if you like. So yes, I think Cleve does uh, play on the, uh, uh, the 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 two sides of her that she continues to uh, uh, to dress like the Edinburgh advocate. Um, uh, but you know, maybe that's the extent to which. She know that she's never uh, she's never really settled in Shetland. She has ambitions, you know. It's a stepping stone. She is the procurator fiscal, but maybe one day she'll be a QC, you know, in the High Court and the uh, Court of uh, Session. So to that extent, well, maybe she's not allowed in the Pantheon because uh, she's not staying that long. Thank you. Yes, uh, that was some, some really interesting thoughts on that and, and how that fits in with uh, with the wider the wider genre. And yeah, there's so much to unpick with her character. Um, so yeah, really, really intriguing. Um, on the subject, I think of staying on the, the subject of of how the police relates um, to or relates um, to the people that live there. I, I was wondering, um, Simon, it does the site that you were talking about does does old scatness or does it is it old scatness or just scatness um i don't know where the where i got the old from there uh, but does scatness um does it fit quite comfortably with what's going on in terms of the change of settlement patterns and um and uh rel relative prestige of the of the different accommodations does it fit quite well with what's going on elsewhere in scotland or, or is it something? Is it something quite unique that's going on there, in terms of the changes that you were talking about? It, 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 it appears to fit the general pattern. Um, I need to say that there, there are obviously a very limited number of rocks that have been dug to that standard anywhere in Scotland, and it's, it's the only one that's been dug on that scale in in Shetland. Um, so it's it's difficult to say. It's it's relatively unique in terms of the scale of the surrounding settlement. Um, there are other villages in Orkney, uh, but if you look at the, the the textbooks, they'll they'll say that you get you get rock villages in Orkney, but you don't get them in Shetland. And um, before Scatness, we didn't know of any certainly. But we, on the other hand, we haven't dug extensively enough to really be be certain. But certainly, many brocks would have been. Um, would have remained at this sort of splendid isolation stage of just being a tower within a small enclosure, and their dependent community would have been at a distance. So th there are there is a degree of uniqueness about Scatness, and of course the landscape of the South Mainland is quite different from most of the rest of Shetland. It's potentially more fertile. It's got much more in common with Orkney in terms of its uh, more recent uh, agricultural past and so on. It's the only part of Shetland that has the the, the round uh, corn dryers, which are actually an import from 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 Orkney, uh, in terms of architectural style. Um, so the, it's yeah, it's 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 important to to see the general pattern, but to to actually recognise that you're you're necessarily making um, normative statements, boulderizing the the broad patterns in terms of your description. Thank you, and uh, yes, I'm afraid we're going to have to call things to. A close um, just now. Um. Um, so, uh, 
we will now start our new session, Icelandic Women, Vital and Constant Figures in Icelandic Society. So if those who are not um, speaking would like to just turn off uh, your, um, you call it? your um, mute yourselves, yeah, there you go, uh, that would be great. And um, we'll get started. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Beth Rogers, who's going to talk about skier tactics, skier, that lovely Icelandic uh, food. Now, uh, Beth is an instructor and a PhD student at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik, and she's studying topics of food history and medieval Icelandic culture. It's a very interesting uh, mix. So looking forward to hearing what Beth has to say. So Beth, if you'd like to take it away. Hello, hello, good morning, everyone. And uh, I, it's to my very great sorrow that we weren't able to meet in person because I had arranged to bring you all some skier for those of you who have never had it before. So hmm, next time, if we get round to uh, organizing that conference we were just talking about. Um, I don't have the ability to share my screen yet, Andrew. I don't know if you press the button. <laughs> There we go. All right, on our way. There it is. Okay, so I think I am full screen in just a second. Ha oh, ha. All righty. And so begins my time here at the Saint Magnus Conference. Thank you very much. And oh, there we go. Okay, so I am covering uh, for you today the concept of cultural memory as it relates to food, uh, specifically dairy. And this is my topic for my PhD a research. It uh, feeds directly into uh, agriculture and the status of women, which are also things that my fellows uh, in my session, Megan and Athne, are going to speak on as well. So it's all of one piece for the three of us. Um, this uh, particular talk is going to talk, as we mentioned, about the lovely skier uh, and uh, butter in particular. So this is about how the idea of cultural memory comes about, how it grows and changes over time from the earliest uh, evolution of Icelandic settlement all the way back in the very beginning of the Viking Age in the 9th century and it's carried through to the present day, uh, especially in things like how our skier and dairy products are marketed around the world. Alrighty, so this is what we're going to be talking about specifically. First, we're going to have a little bit of a historical uh, background. Then we're going to talk about uh, the dairy economy and women's roles in it. And then, of course, in today's world as well. What is it all about? Why does it matter? Uh, it's not just me who's obsessed with cheese. No, no, absolutely not. So here we go. And on we go. <clears throat> I can't read my titles because of the lovely faces in the way, but uh, it's important to note for the purposes of my research, of course, many of you may know this, uh, lactose tolerance is a very special and specific quality in certain areas of the world. 65% of the world are, or more are fully lactose intolerant, and then other populations uh, may indeed have uh, sensitivities to lactose. So you can see on the map there, the very white areas, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> um, uh, are those who are more likely to be lactose tolerant which means that they have the ability to digest lactase, a particular enzyme in the dairy products uh, that is separated out in our stomachs as it does its lovely work to nourish us. Uh, other people who don't have this ability to, to break down this particular enzyme will of course get an upset tummy if they drink too much milk. Okay. And also of importance to note is the, the status of three particular animals in our um, 
Icelandic milieu. Uh, these are the three most important milk producing animals throughout Icelandic history, uh, cattle, sheep and goats. And this is just a little chart that sort of shares with any of you who may not know or be quite as excited by agriculture and farming as I am. Uh, what it all is about these animals that makes them attractive to certain farmers or not. Uh, cattle in particular is highly, highly valued, but the problem with them is, of course, they're less adaptable, they're very large, uh, they are more delicate and susceptible to disease, but of course they do have uh, traction power, they have milk in great quantity, all great stuff if you can afford the resources to feed and take care of them. Uh, sheep, on the other hand, have meat, wool and milk, and the wool becomes more and more important as time goes on in Iceland, which is something Megan knows very well about and she's going to speak next. Uh, the good thing about sheep is, of course, they're very adaptable to food and climate change and they are drought tolerant. So whatever's going on in Iceland, it may change uh, a few times in the same day. We never know what we're going to get here. Uh, so a sheep will do you good for that. And on the other hand, goats, um, they have meat and milk as their value. They're typically uh, going to give you more milk than a sheep or a cow. Uh, and that's very good for the poorest of farmers. And Mary Williams in 1920, in a book on uh, Scandinavian society, remarked that a farm was very poor indeed if they didn't even have a goat. Mm -hmm. So what is it all about these animals that makes them so significant? Well, in Norway, where the first majority of settlers came from, who came to Iceland, uh, they had more landscape in a more hospitable climate. That is, they are in a completely different biome. We are subarctic up here. So they had greater opportunities for livestock in Norway and also other products like cereals and grain and fish to get them through times of shortage. Uh, for example, a high status farm in Acre in Norway is shown to have thousands and thousands of specimens of archaeofauna, 50% of which was cattle alone, followed by pigs and sheep and goats. And one of our lovely archaeologists famous for working up here in Iceland, Andrew Dugmore, uh, notes that the pattern probably represented the ideal farm in the minds of the chieftains of the Landnaum area, Landnaum mean, being the word for settlement of Iceland. And so uh, when you look at our earliest ar archaeological remains, uh, you see a large number of cattle and pig bones. So the idea is they came here to this glorious land, which the sagas uh, in some of our documents tell us was forested from coast to coast, a beautiful new land, untouched. And then they introduced these um, quite hungry animals into this, the mix, and uh, in the successive years they thought to themselves, why aren't the trees growing back? Oh no! So that sort of uh, occurred to them as time went on. Okay, and the problem with that, the reason is because, as Thomas Amorosi, another archaeologist, tells us, cattle and goats can strip trees entirely of leaves and bark, Pigs tear up roots and successive gra grazing of a subarctic woodland by horses, cattle and sheep could rapidly roll back forests and absolutely stop regeneration in its tracks. So very quickly, the first settlers of Iceland realized they had a problem with trying to balance their livestock and make a go of this new settlement in this quite, quite difficult environment. All right, so this is a lovely little mini history of um, animal husbandry in the North Atlantic. And this is uh, essentially a small look at uh, the changes that were made. And the reason that they were made was the one that I just mentioned, because they were trying to find that balance where they could have their livestock, they could have uh, what they considered a wealthy or high value farm. Uh, but not starve in the winter because all the bark and the trees had been stripped away. So what we see in our uh, record, our archaeological record, uh, is that um, in the settlement period, 
first we employed wild uh, resources like uh, fish and bird eggs especially uh, to supplement while the original settlers were waiting for their um, <clears throat> excuse me, waiting for their domestic stock uh, to grow that they had brought over from Norway and from Denmark. And of course, by the 9th and 10th centuries, their domestic stock had grown, and so they were able to focus on recreating these lovely, wealthy farms from places like Norway that they remembered as being very impressive. And uh, so cattle became a status symbol due to all of the upkeep and resources needed to support a large herd. But by the early Commonwealth period, in the 11th and 12th century, this had fallen quite out of fashion. Only the very richest and quite luckiest uh, wealthy farmers could support this at all uh, due to the ecological uh, damage being done by livestock. And so a majority of farmers had switched to uh, sheep because they were easier to take care of. They gave a, a fair amount of meat and milk. And of course, uh, they also provided wool, which became a, a major um, marketable and economic boon for Iceland at that time. And then in the later medieval period to the early modern times, uh, it became all about the fish and it remains so to this day. Okay. So then we want to move into a little bit of background and also women. What's going on with the ladies, really? Uh, are they just in the kitchen? Well, of course not. Any woman could tell you that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so milking and further processing milk was a female com competency uh, belonging to the female sphere in Northwestern Europe long before the Middle Ages. And it remained so through the early 20th century. Uh, Dem Deborah Simonton states in her overview of female labor in modern history that particularly dairying was recognized as a craft and involved passing on skills and the mysteries associated with it from mother to daughter. This connection between women and milking or dairying is also well known from the Middle Ages. There's no biological determination to say that women are more suited than men, of course, to milking or uh, processing dairy products. But uh, by, uh, oh, excuse me. But the handling of milk was quickly made a, a part of the feminine sphere in most cultures. And in fact, in the Icelandic sagas, we do have a couple of scenes where um, everyone is obliged to help out on the farm. Uh, servants are of both male and female gender, uh, but of course the men of the house refuse to do the milking because it will make them seem feminine to do so. So there's the implication that it's an exclusively feminine task at some point in the Middle Ages. So historically this work was assigned to women for social and historical reasons. And uh, one of them was that uh, you could, of course, do this work. You could hold the baby in one hand and milk with the other if you had to. Um, for good or for ill, women have had a unique uh, position in terms of dairy production throughout history. And um, in the resource poor environment like Iceland, as we've just discussed their uh, struggles, uh, both sexes were required for the family and for the society to survive. So Jenny Jochens points out the basic distinction between male and female work, as you see there, uh, is that men exploit nature directly, whereas women's work primarily consists of processing and converting the, fem the male work for short-term consumption and long-term preservation. So uh, this was a craft that was passing on skills from generation to generation. And uh, the reason for this is, uh, although we don't always think about the work that goes into our uh, modern food production due to how automated it is, uh, these women were particularly skilled in, for example, encouraging the cattle or the sheep to release the milk. They were skilled in properly preserving it so that it would remain fresh for long uh, times. And they were also skilled in bringing out the freshest and best flavors that were preferred in their region. So really, there was a lot of competency being shown in something as simple as collecting milk and formulating our, our lovely skier. Okay. 
Okay, so every step in making uh, the, the manufacture of butter demanded great skill. Milking was a tough job, but also demanded uh, knowledges and competencies uh, comparable to that of the equestrian in relation to a horse. Um, and so it shouldn't be underestimated. Okay, and of course, uh, the milking brings them out of doors for much of the year. Uh, this also is part of Icelandic culture, that the dairying field should be far from the home. So we're quickly seeing uh, in Icelandic culture and in dairying cultures throughout the Celtic and Gaelic areas as well, that there is a much more balanced attitude towards uh, women and working than there may have been in other places such as the Mediterranean, uh, where women were more uh, closely kept to home, for example. Okay, so this is just a small look at how the law reflects these ideas. And uh, this is Graugas, which is our first law. It's called the Grey Goose, and we're not at all sure why the law book is called that, but we love it. So, um, for example, it says men may drive the livestock out and in again, women may do milking, and they may carry the milk wherever it is to be carried, etc., etc. And so this is interesting for a few reasons. One, it does delineate the division of labor as I've just described it. Men are in charge of the livestock, women do the milking. And second of all, um, this actually exists in an area of Kralgos, which deals with Christian law. So they are saying in the longer passage of this that uh, they may do this work even on holy days. So this is sort of an acknowledgement that the work in a resource poor environment like uh, Iceland was constant and specifically for the livestock and the milk bearing animals. It had to be done, you know, even if perhaps Jesus would make a frowny face over it. Okay. Other examples of its importance in the law include things like it's possible to summon full outlawry for the theft of food, however much or little in quantity, whenever a man steals anything edible or freshly slaughtered. Anyone who wittingly receives or buys something which has been thieved incurs the same penalty as the man who stole it. He is a thief's accomplice and so is the man who plotted the theft. So these are two examples regarding uh, food theft. Uh, in Graugas, and what this tells us, even if we can say, of course, this is just an idealized law book, uh, we have no evidence that the law was actually carried out this way, true, that is true, but we can say in looking at the way this is phrased that food theft was very serious, food outlawry, or excuse me, full outlawry in Iceland at this time meant that you would be exiled from the island entirely. So that means they will kick you out if you mess with the food supply in any way. So this does at least relate to uh, a lot of anxiety about the food supply and in particular the milk. And this is also notable in one of our sagas. We have an example that's quite famous of a woman from a saga who uh, stole uh, butter from a neighbor. And when the husband came home, he um, he saw the butter on the table and he knew that the house had none. So he immediately became suspicious and asked his wife, what is this? You know, where did this come from? She, of course, lies and he, he slaps her across the face because it is such a, a an affront, a shock, a horrible thing that she's done. And it's worth noting that by this time in the story, this character has brought about the deaths of several men, but it's the uh, the food theft which pushes her husband over the edge because not only has her actions endangered uh, herself, but also him. If he were to eat that food, knowing that it was uh, stolen, he would be in as great a trouble as she and potentially they could lose their land holding and their, their place in Iceland, all because uh, of the butter. Okay, so this also indicates the uh, incredible amount of work once more. And we can even see it in this uh, lovely image of the workshop of the master of James the IV, uh, which is Flemish from 1541. You see the men in the front there with the staff of the herder where the women are working the churn in the background of that image. So again, the ladies are expected to work with the milk. Mm -hmm. 
And then it continues again ahead in history. This is the Buoloch, which is another uh, lovely uh, law book, uh, which is a later period. And they mention Skier and Butter by name. Uh, you can see right here, male and female servants were uh, required to be given a certain amount of Skier, Butter and Fish, making a uh, foundation for the Icelandic diet. And 60%, if you were looking through, uh, as I did, uh, I apologize, this graphic is for ants, but I decided to just drop in the full page there. If you look at this um, examination as well, uh, caloric diets and uh, measurements for five households by 1847 in Iceland, skier, butter and milk are still featuring in a good quantity. And so it's roughly estimated that about 60% of the Icelandic diet comes from dairy products alone. So it's quite exciting that. Okay, significant AF, as the younger scholars may say. And so what is this all about? What does this mean? And how does this help understand modern Icelandic society in any way? If we know all of this uh, has happened throughout history in our literature, in our law, and in the way that our society was structured as far as men and women and gendered work, what is it all about? Hmm. Okay. Well, when we're thinking about it in terms of cultural memory, then of course we're thinking uh, that uh, contemporary images of the past, uh, they are related sometimes by appropriation, sometimes preservation, and sometimes, of course, transformation. And do we see that? Absolutely we do. If I had a, a, a minute to my name, which I do not, uh, I would share with you an ad for uh, our skier. You can see right here in the upper right hand corner, the, the, the lid to an Ise skier. And it specifically says uh, Ise is a name for the island of Iceland. And we'd like to thank our women for the recipe of skier and all the work they have done over time. And the adverts that you see, uh, they use a tagline that says, we always had our skier. So they are promoting this image of women and uh, they are showing as well this link to the past about women, abundance of food being in the form of dairy specifically and the, and, uh, the dairy food itself. Okay, and then we talk about as well, uh, Jan Asman again, what a champion, uh, cultural memory being reflexive in three ways. And the, the one I most focus on is being reflexive of its own image, because it does not seem to me, of course, that uh, Iceland would be one of the world's most gender equal countries if the women have been working consistently from the very time of settlement all the way to the present day uh, in the dairy with the livestock on the farm and beyond. And so it's reflected there as well. Just a couple of other mentions as I wrap up. Uh, and of course, in the present day, we are being affected by uh, current events. Brexit, as I'm sure you guys all have wonderful thoughts about that lovely uh, <clears throat> debacle from a couple of years ago. Um, dairy products may become luxuries after the UK uh, leaves the EU. Uh, of course, that was big news. And how does that affect culture? It's all kinds of interesting research into food and cultural meaning that we may do. And then, of course, also most recently, COVID ruining everything. Um, uh, what does it mean that we have this massive abundance of, of cheese and dairy and lovely things uh, that isn't going anywhere? What does that mean to our culture and the way that we think about our food and consume it? It's all wrapped up there uh, because the main takeaway I'd like you to have through its cultural heritage, a society becomes visible to itself and others. And so it is, of course, with Iceland, the women and their skis. Thank you so very thank much. You very much. Indeed, yes. And there is my contact information if any of you would like to ask me anything else further. But thank you very much. Lovely. Excellent. Well, there's some questions building up for you, so we'll <laughs> we'll keep those uh, until the the end of the the three uh, talks. So thank you very much, Beth. And I will pass the uh, the ball to Megan. Just a second. 
Okay. Uh, Megan is going to talk about the role of the housewife in medieval Icelandic uh, society. And um, Megan is a doctor, doc doctoral candidate at the Department of History. Good there. Um, at the University of Iceland, and her project examines the interaction of gender, labour and power in the production of homespun cloth on medieval Icelandic farmsteads. So, uh, with that, uh, Megan, please uh, take it away. Yeah, um, you can see my screen, full screen, no problem? Yes, we see you full screen. You're not doing a uh, slide share though, but we can see the, the screen and the, uh, the other I slides down the side. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the Institute for Northern Studies for all the work planning this wonderful conference, uh, you know, a year later and all that, but it's fantastic. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to be addressing the conference's theme of the question of equal contribution of women and men in the North Atlantic island life, specifically looking at the medieval Icelandic household as represented in the Icelandic family sagas. So this means that I'm going to be looking at stories that are set in the 10th, roughly 10th to 11th century, but written later in the 12th century and further. So I'm using the sagas here as sources of the attitudes of the saga writers about appropriate actions and spaces for women in their society. So the societies, sorry, the sagas are believed to be written by men and are largely about men with women characters in secondary or supporting roles. This bias is often also reflected in the stories as they highlight the primary importance of the husbands and their successful navigation in the realms of politics, trade, and other social relationships that determine the success or failure of their households and families. However, we can look behind these male activities to the household and the social structures and community that held up the world of these male saga characters. So in this paper, I'm going to argue that the housewife represents one half of the household head and both held equally important roles in a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship that was key to the household and community success. So first, we'll explore the definition of marriage in the conjugal households. Then we'll discuss the idea of separate spheres of gender influence and the idea of the farm as a place of multifunctional activity. Then we'll examine the roles of the husband and wife then what special responsibilities the wife held when her husband was away. And then finally, we will look at an example from my thesis project on woolen cloth, which was used as money. And this shows how th this will show how the partnership was depended on and mutually benefiting each other. The starting point here is to discuss the basic form that a household took in the medieval period in Iceland. So the medieval, medieval Icelandic farmstead was a conjugal household. That is, it was headed by the married husband and wife. And the term for household is hyon, which both refers to the married couple and the household people as a whole. There could also be children, servants, or slaves, and this could include de other dependents like extended family, fostered children, friends, guests, and other supporters. Who could be married and household rights were determined by law. For example, in the legal code Gragas, which Beth already mentioned, um, in order to be married, there was a minimum property requirement of 120 ounce units of legal tender and more if there were any dependents. These, were, these regulations were very important because it ensured that the couple had enough resources to establish a successful farm household and they needed to have enough land and labor to support themselves so that they would not be a burden on their family or community. For if they fell into a hard time, they were required to disband their household and return to their families. Marriage was also a financial transaction, as the father or legal guardian would exchange the bride for the bride price, called Munder, in return for the husband's right to become her legal guardian and have the right to control her property. The bride's family could also pay a dowry, which would be absorbed into the family's property, the husband's property, and for to be used during their married life with the consent of his wife. So an example from the sagas is from Niel Saga, which demonstrates how a household could be established in the contractual and economic nature of this transaction. Rutger Hryjofsson and his brother Hoskold approaches Mord about making a marriage contract for his daughter Unar. Mord said that the contract would have to be large because she was his sole heir. They make the contract and it states that Rutger will contribute three properties of land and a ship 
and Mord would give 60 hundred, so this is a unit of money, um, as dowry, and Hoot would also contribute 30 hundreds as a bride price. They marry at her father's farm, and then they move to the husband's farm at Hootsadder, where she is given, quote, full authority over matters inside the house, and she had sole authority over as much as she wanted, end quote. Most of the financial aspects of the marital economy are based on inherited property of both the husband and wife, as the purpose of inheritance is mainly to set up the next generation's household. These assets included the husband and wife's inherited property, but also common property that was acquired after the marriage. Inherited property was essentially held in trust for future generations of the kinship group, with the assumption that one would work to build upon this property as it is, is a cyclical system with the younger generation depending on the elder generation for inheritance, but the elder depending on the younger for maintenance and labor to increase resources. To give another example from Lex de la Saga um, of the investment or financial injection is the marriage of Joran Bjarnadotter to Hoskolder Dalekolsen, who resided at Hoskolstadter. Hoskol received his inheritance after his parents' death inheriting his father's property and takes over the running of this farm, but also wealth from his money. So then he goes to see Bjorn about his daughter Joran, and they're betrothed with a large amount of money, had a great wedding feast, and then lived at his farm where, quote, she assumed her duties in running the farm along with Hoskold. These examples show that marriages involved an investment of land and money, and that there was an expectation that the wife would hold an active role in running the farm alongside her husband. As the marriage is based both on land and monetary property from both partners, they both have a stake in its success. The household is headed by the husband and wife, and while a household could form with, without a married couple, there would be a pseudo spouse in the form of manager or stewardess who would have the responsibilities without the rights that came from being the head of household. The conjugal partnership is best represented by the phrase in an uten stock, which represents the husband and wife's spheres of influence being out or inside the house. This can be seen in Kjolna Singa Saga with the marriage of Thorod and Andridi of Brotherholt, when after their marriage, she took over, quote, the domestic affairs of the farm, end quote. This is not a sense of the women's dom domestic sphere as being private in the sense of hidden away from the public eye. If we think of the actual house on the farmstead, it is neither a public nor private space. The basic architectural form in the early medieval period was the longhouse with its three aisles, largely open space, and no sense of privacy in the sense of a modern bedroom. There could be annexes and separate rooms, but there was never a distinct separation of work life and work and public life from the private life of family until much later. The household is a site of all kinds of activity as domestic space was multifunctional. This of course includes family life with marital relationships, birth and child care, sleep, illness, death, farm work, and daily activities. But it was also the site of what we would normally consider public activities, visiting friends and hosting guests, politics for the creation and maintenance of alliances and social bonds, feasts and gift giving, violence and conflict, especially with feuds, and the sale and trade of goods. The household is best seen as a community headed by the couple and with all the members as different cogs working for a common purpose, survival and reproduction. These husband and wife were in charge of the household and were in constant negotiation with each other concerning matters of production, both sexual and social, production, subsistence, and surplus, including the hire and organization of labor, and the distribution and consumption of food and goods. This was not an egalitarian partnership in terms of power, but nonetheless, it was a partnership with shared and separate responsibilities. So if we, if we refer to the original question of do sagas reflect the balance of power, balance of gender responsibilities, sorry, there is a difference in power but both the husband and wife were key valuable assets as managers in, of different spheres of influence. This is more of a symbiotic relationship where both depended upon and benefited from the work of the other. This negotiation can be seen in an example from Bjorn Saga Hito de Kappa, where there's a tense conversation between the couple Ogni and Thor about the day's work responsibilities and the need for everyone to be useful. Quote, 
Now both men and women are going there to stack corn, he said, but you are to stay at home because the sheep will be driven in during the day and you must be here to see to the milking, though you don't usually do it. She said, then I can see just the man to shovel dung from the sheep pens. That's what you're to do, end quote. The housewife was the constant presence in the household and managed the daily cycles of life and labor on the, far, on the farm and had just as much authority there as her husband. We can see this in Brunignel Saga, where when hiring a field worker, Bergthorne is questioned about her authority to do so, and she answers, quote, I am Niall's wife, she said, and I have no less authority in hiring than he does, end quote. The housewife role, housewife's role was a vital one to the functioning of work and activities. Rikidal Saga and Vigaskutu provides an example of the necessity of the wife to the functioning of the farm. Helga Granadotter had married Hals and they lived at Hel Hel sorry, Helga Stadler, but when she was not happy with her married life, she ran away and returned to her father's household. Hals went to her family to ask her to return because, quote, he thought he could hardly manage the farm if Helga, his wife, did not come home, end quote. On the other hand, the husband was the head of the household and responsible for all the public facing aspects of the household. His presence at the farmstead, however, fluctuated according to his other responsibilities. Seasonal work that may take him away from the farm, political obligations at assembly sites near and far away, traveling within the country to support his allies in feud violence, or traveling abroad for trading or building his reputation as a courtier in foreign courts. This often involved being gone for long periods of time. So what happens when he leaves? Who does he pass his responsibilities on to? Sometimes he passes it on to his brothers, mothers, or stewards, but he could also pass authority on to his wife. The sagas provide several examples of husbands leaving their farms and responsibilities in the hands of their wives. Osbrella Saga tells of the chieftain Vermander Thorgumson leaving his district in Vatnesjord in the hands of his wife Thorberg Olafsdotter whenever he was away, and people were satisfied with how she handled matters. That Vatnesdala Saga tells of Ingimander Gamli Thorsteinsen leaving his estate at Hof in the hands of some men and his wife Vigdis Thorsdotter when he goes abroad. Quote, when Ingmund had lived for some time at Hof, he announced that he was going abroad to collect building wood for himself because he said that he wanted to live in fine style there and that he expected King Harold to greet him warmly. Vigdi said that this was that good was to be expected from the king. He appointed men to look after the state along with Vigdis. Ax de la Saga tells of Jorn Bardner's daughter being left behind to care for uh, Hoskoller Dalkson's farm and children at Hoskostader when he went abroad. Quote, the building on, buildings on Hoskold's farm were far from his liking, as he felt them unworthy of a man in his situation. He made his ship ready and declared his intention to travel abroad, leaving Jorn to look after his farm and children. And his property had been well, well looked after in his absence. Another account in Lexdale Saga tells of Olafur Hoskelson leaving his wife Thorgerder Eggel's daughter in charge of their farm while he's abroad. Quote, it is said that one spring, Olaf announced to Thorger that he traveled, intended to travel abroad, and I want you to look after our farm and family while I'm away. Thorger, Thorger said that she was not in favor of the idea, but Olaf said he intended to have his way. So the words used in these examples indicate these wives' right to rule the household in her husband's absence indicating management, authority, superintendence, and holding custody of their farm on behalf of their husband while he does business on behalf of the household. So far we've established that the medieval Icelandic farmstead was headed by the husband and wife as partners. Both had higher status positions as the male and female head of household. I want to end this paper with uh, an example from my thesis project to show how the household activity could cross between these two realms of authority. We'll be looking here at the woolen cloth known as Vavma, which was used as the main form of currency and export product in the medieval period. This is an interesting product because it transcends both the male and female world and reflects the qu required interaction and mutually dependent present of wife and husband. 
Medieval Iceland was a pastoral, sedentary agricultural society, which Beth did a great job explaining just a few minutes ago. But it was also um, a subsistence economy that produced uh, goods to sustain themselves, but depended also on the import of essential goods like flour and prestige goods. In terms of the conjugal partnership, the husband and wife had to make decisions about the preparation, production, and distribution of this woolen product. They had to decide on the size of the flock in terms of meat and wool needs, when to slaughter, seasonal grazing strategies, how much material will be needed for weaving projects, so in terms of prepping spun wool, or de determining the dimensions and pattern of the, the cloth before you even started weaving, and also how much would how much uh, cloth would be needed for household needs versus surplus to be used as money. When wool becomes transformed into money, so this is specific standardized lengths of cloth, it would be used in the public sphere of politics and law with dowry and bride price payments to create alliances, in blood feud compensation payments, in rents, tithe payments, and export goods to be exchanged for necessary foreign goods. In all of these cases, playing a role in building and maintaining the status and honor of the man on behalf of his family and household. So if we look at it uh, broadly, this material crosses both the Innen and Utan stock, sometimes sitting in both realms, but requires the work and management of both the husband and wife. Here, there is a key role for the housewife in her position as the partner and manager of the affairs of the household especially in her control of labor, labor and the literal production of money. So in summary, the marital par partnership is the key to or foundation upon which all other household activities rested. We have discovered that the medieval household was a conjugal unit and partnership that involved investment, responsibilities, and opportunities for, for both parties. We can find evidence of this partnership in the Icelandic family sagas where the housewife has a higher social status and rights through her position of authority in the household in the absence of her husband, despite an imbalance focused on the actions and adventures of men in the sagas. The housewife was the constant present on the farmstead that helped to organize household economy and its labor, production, and the consumption of resources. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Megan. I um, particularly enjoyed your um, your slides. Uh, very clear and uh, um, got the the, um, the information over very well. I think your description of the vital relationship between husband and wife in medieval um, Iceland could be equally applicable to uh, medieval Shetland. So um, there's some questions um, being sent in about that as well. So thank you very much indeed. And we'll pass now to uh, Arne Juliusson. Uh, so hello Arne, I'll just move the, uh, the presenter roll over to you. Yes, we can hear you. Now Arne is um, a historian and he's worked on um, a number of um, um, important projects. Uh, he says he began his career in 1988, very good, um, and he's now leading a, a new research project with 20, 20 participants um, on class and social conflicts in Northern Iceland between 870 and 1500. And today he's going to talk about um, 18th century ideas of the economic role of Icelandic women. So thank you very much, Arne. Take it away. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Very nice to be uh, here. Uh, wish I was there. But um, um, what uh, I will talk about the status of women in the uh, 18th century, both economic and I will also touch on the social and cultural aspect. Um, I will give an outline of the social structure and then take a closer look at two sources. These are a 50 page handbook for housewives from uh, it's, it's written about 1780. Uh, written by a priest in Westfjords in the four-page autobiography of Guðrún Ketilsdóttir in Eyjafjörður, who was born in 1759. And uh, the picture we're seeing is, is uh, from Kalmanstunga in Borgarfjörður. Uh, there's, uh, there are, there are women, women working on, on drying bed clothes or, or, or clothes of other kind and children 
wrong. Um, uh, we can say that the 18th century was a time of huge change regarding ideas about society. Um, but um, but before we start to discuss that, I would like to point to some sources. Uh, this is the Agricultural History of Iceland on the picture, published in 2013. It's in Icelandic, it's some sources in English. It's uh, Hrefna Robertsdóttir, Wool and uh, Society, very important PhD. And there I have a, a, an article in the Scandinavian Economic History Review recently. And on, uh, on the social aspect, we have uh, English translation of Lofta Guttumsson's Childhood, Youth and Upbringing in the Age of Absolutism. And a key work of gender history with a bit earlier focus, Agnes Arnusdóttir, Property and Maturity, the Christianization of Marriage in, in, in Medieval Iceland. This is based on research into the Diplomatarium Islandicum, which is uh, an interesting and an un, un, underused source. Yes, uh, but now uh, again to the 18th century and uh, to the Westfjords, we see here a uh, Sauðlaugsdalur in uh, the southern part of the Westfjords. This is uh, uh, basically unchanged since the time of Björn Haldorsson, except maybe for the buildings. Uh, we have this small uh, meadow, hay meadow and, and uh, sort of very steep hills and uh, little lowland there. Björn Haldorsson was a priest in the uh, West Fjords. He lived from 1724 to 1994. He, um, lived, he was always connected to this farm, Sauðlaugstaler uh, church farm where he lived in the prime of his life. He was a primary intellectual of the Enlightenment in Iceland, published several books on agriculture, cultivation, etc. Um, what was very important uh, was that he introduced potatoes to Iceland. They became popular in his time, but uh, and then spread throughout the country and became a staple in the 19th century. His most popular book was Atli, which is a 150-page guide for young farmers. And the book I'm discussing here next is Arnbjörg, and this came after that, probably written in, in 1780, as I said. And this is the title page of Arnbjörg. Um, Arnbjörg Eiru Prit Dandis Kvinna á Vestfjörðum Íslands. Uh, Afmálar skikkun og hátt sem er góðar húsmóður í bústjórn, barna uppbildi og allri innan bæja búsíslu. Uh, this means that she is a very uh, honorable uh, woman in the West Church of Iceland and uh, it tells about uh, how she is supposed to, how a good housewife is supposed to control the, 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 the bú, the, the uh, farm, uh, the in in indoor farm like Megan said the upbringing of children and, and uh, everything inside of the house. Um, this uh, was uh, in, intended as a guide for our women who intended to become Husfreya or housewife. It was not published in Björn's lifetime, maybe because uh, he went blind in 1785 and was not very active thereafter. Um, this little essay contains lots of information about the status of women in the 18th century and ideas related to that. Uh, topics of discussion in Arnberg, this is religion, superstition and ghosts, the education of children, the production of woolens in the home, uh, the production of milk and pro milk products in the home, this is things we have heard about already. Now we are in the 18th century, um, cleaning of house, clothing and people, the role of a housewife as a manager and controller of servant women and working women in the home. Um, but, uh, before we uh, uh, carry on with discussing Artberg, I would like to give some 
uh, idea about the structure of Icelandic society in this time. We can see here a map of the farms in Iceland uh, in 1702 to 1714, according to the Jarðabók Árna Magnússonar and Paul Svítalins. You heard about Árni Magnússon earlier here with uh, in Andrew's lecture. And uh, we also see the consequences of the Great Fire of uh, in, in Copenhagen 1728, it not only destroyed the Latin poem of Olaus, but also the part of the Jarðabók that is uh, missing here in the East Fjords. We only have the North, the West and the South, but which is extremely valuable in any case. But um, there were, seven, in 173, there were about 50,000 people in Iceland living in seven to 8,000 households. Their numbers soon dwindled to 32,000 because of a really bad smallpox epidemic in 1707. COVID is nothing to compare, com compare to that. It, it killed 18,000 Icelanders, a third of Icelanders. But in 1780, the population was about 50,000 again. And uh, we see here uh, on this map the 4,000 full farms with the le legal status as such. Uh, and, uh, there were about, uh, as, as I said, about seven to eight thousand far families living on these farms. And so each, each farm had on average about two families. There were some small villages in the countryside, especially in the south, south part of the country here. Uh, I would like to mention, this is the place where uh, Haldorsson lived, in, this is in Söðlöksdal. And uh, later we will be talking about Guðrún Ketilsdóttir, she lived here in, in um, Eyjafjörður. Uh, now we can see the farm. Uh, uh, this is a uh, um, early 19th century picture from Guy Marr, a Frenchman who came to Iceland and, and, and drew pictures. Uh, Yes, these farms, they were autonomous regarding production and consumption, produced most of what was consumed there, both clothing and food. Women were managers of food and clothes production uh, in the 18th century, just as in the Middle Ages. So there were 8,000 women engaged in managing key aspects of production and consumption at the farms. Um, yes. Wait just a minute, I'm orienting myself. Yes. Um, um, and about the culture, a full-blown Lutheranism was in place in Iceland in this period. A printing press at Hólar and Hjaltadalur regularly published ABCs, catechismus, every five years or so in considerable quantities. Every child was from about 1600 supposed to learn to read at a young age. This went both for girls and boys. And by 1780, this was the reality. Most children did learn to read. Housewives seems, seem to have been the main executioners of the educational goals set by the um, by the royal by the Lutheran Kingdom of of Denmark Norway. Um, and uh, now we start discussing religion. Uh, it is interesting. A discussion of religion in Arnbjörg. The housewife is supposed to lead the way in intent interpreting and defining the religious practices and ideas in the household. Um, I would like to say uh, first uh, that the Lutheran is, Lutheranism is poorly understood in the Icelandic context. It contained socially progressive ideas about individual rights that rarely uh, have been discussed. This is reflected in Ardenburg. At times it reads like some rather recent essay on morality. 
um, common sense and human rights. The tone is set, it sets, is decisive, is, is a rather modern in tone, reflecting the prevailing atmosphere among clerics intellect or intellectuals, which were often the same in the Danish Norwegian kingdom in the 18th century. This atmosphere was to a large extent the product of the Reformation Revolution. Um, but the housewife in Arbjörg uh, is warned not to fall into superstition and believe in supernatural beings like ghosts, fairies, etc. This is typical enlightenment, which only serve to awaken unnecessary fear and neurosis among the household. See, uh, neither is he to uphold superstition related to believing in special days, for example, uh, that they are better to doing certain things that become that uh, than others. And Björn is quite adamant that this is this should not be practiced. This held through superstition. Um, of no less interest is the role attributed to uh, uh, a housewife in educating her children. She is supposed to oversee the process of teaching children to read. Uh, there are clear and interesting directions about how this is to be done. At the beginning, the children are to be taught by the housewife to figure out the, which letters of the alphabet are to be found in words they are learning or using. Then they shall start learning to read printed text. Finally, when they are fluent readers, they shall read um, the Catechismus, which we hear, see here. Uh, uh, this is an edition from 1617, and uh, it shows there are four pictures, uh, three of them showing um, the, the commandment, three of the, the th ten commandments. And um, uh, there's also, uh, besides this sort of cultural aspect of, of, of uh, the role of the housewife in the 18th century, there's, there's, um, there's, uh, uh, there's some, a lot about woolens and milk and how to how to sort of manage the home. As Beth and Megan have described in this panel, women oversaw the milk industry and wool industry in Iceland in the Middle Ages. This was still the case in 1780. Ardenberg gives extensive instructions on many aspects of woolen production, the treatment of raw wool, knitting, weaving, coloring, etc. It is quite clear that it is the job of the housewife to manage the process of producing cloth out of wool. Still in the 18th century, the production of clothing for wearing at the farm is the primary ob objective, but trade and production for paying land rent is mentioned. Production out of milk is discussed as at length. The two main products were butter, either salted or fermented, and skir, uh, the cheese we have heard so much about with Beth. Uh, from Beth, there is a memorable description of the difference between salted uh, butter intended for export in part that kept two years and fermented butter, butter which could be kept for uh, 20 years. Um, Mesa has also discussed this was whey, a liquid that was a byproduct of skill production. It was used for many purposes, drinking and preserving meat. Um, Yes, so this was um, Arden Björk, and um, as I said, this gives a, a um, uh, gives a good idea of and, and man, a very very uh, it's a very interesting thing, manifested uh, picture of of the role of housewives, but we have a lack of. Um, sort of uh, research in this area. The 17th and 18th centuries are least, the least researched areas in Icelandic historiography, and this also goes for gender history and, and uh, women, women's history. For example, how, what happened when uh, Iceland converted from Catholicism to uh, 
Lutheranism, what happened to the role of women? We don't have really have any good narrative on that, but we have research on so uh, we have beginnings of research on, on women's history, and here we have an example of that. This is um, a saga of Guðrún Kittlisdóttur by Guðni Hallgrímsdóttir, who is a historian in Reykjavík. Um, it, uh, it concerns um, the oldest female biograph, female biography, autobiography from Iceland, Guðrún Kittlisdóttir's autobiography. She was born in 1759 and learned to read and write from her parents. Guðrún's parents owned 20 printed books. They were originally farmers at the subtenancy, but then moved to a bigger farm. Guðrún wrote her story four pages long in her old age. This is the first preserved autobiography of an Icelandic woman. Um, as I said before, uh, Guðrún was a work hand at the many farms from early on, from a young age. In 1794, uh, at 34 years of age, she ma married a man named Itli. You can see him mentioned there in the text, not very positively. Um, they, yes, they had a son called Jón, who later married in Svarvadalur and had three children, there are still their descendants there and elsewhere in the country. Ten years later, Guðrún and Dítli were separated. At the time, they had their own farm, a cow and 17 ewes. So they had a cow and, and they had sheep, they had ewes. After that, uh, Guðrún became a working girl again, a farm hunt. She died in 1842, close to 84 years old. The historian Guðrún Nýhallgrímsdóttir found this document in the archives and wrote a book about Guðrún's life from the available sources. This was published recently, about 10 years ago. Uh, and I have translated excerpts from this autobiography. Um, um, she is describing her life in the period 1791 to 1794, just before she married. I went to Patlin Thorustadir. She had he had difficulties. He robbed me of my grey you and was a cunning man. I would sooner walk on or with my head than stay there. Because of that, I went to Guðmundur and Kaupangur. This is another farmer. He was very good to me. And um, I was there in great circumstances and everybody loved me because I presented myself for good, for the good everywhere. And then she went to, when I had gone to Siglovik, there were fishermen there, one of whom was from Shatnagil, that bloody fox. His name was Idli, a handsome man, but many a man hides the wolf under the sheep's clothing, so did he. He offered me all service, but uh, unknown or unseen goods robbed many of money. He had bright or blonde hair, wore a blue sweater, a green shirt, a hat, and good shoes. Then came the courtship between me and Italy. I owned five chests, and there was more in them than only the darkness. And then one of them were raisins, and I gave him secretly some of it. So Italy was eight years younger than Guðrún, and uh, um, and uh, they were married for ten years. And but uh, he was cheating on the side all the time. So and finally she gave up, and and uh, they were separated. So this is this is a very uh, lively text Guðrún has written and uh, gives us a totally different view on the reality of women in Iceland than the uh, sort of normative text I had been uh, describing from Björn in Söðlöksdalur. And uh, yeah, so and now I am almost finished. I would like to conclude with that the status of women in the economic 
and Iceland was similar to in the 18th century to earlier and even to the Middle Ages. They ruled uh, in, inside the house and controlled production of wool and milk. Uh, the status in, of women in religion and education might have changed, especially in re religious education um, during the 17th 18th, and 18th centuries. And women started, at least in one case, to write about their lives in the 18th century. And, uh, as I said, research into the changes of the status of women after the Reformation is sorely lacking in Iceland. And, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Arne. So, um, well, has um, Arnbjörg, has it been translated into English? No. It hasn't. One of these days. <laughs> it sounds like a fascinating text. Yes, it is. Super. Well, we've had three extraordinarily interesting um, talks that all bind together uh, beautifully. And we have some questions and we've got some time uh, left to have them answered as well, which is, is great. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll just ask them. They've been sent and people can, um, whoever wants to answer it, uh, speak up. So, um, Gail Ann Riven Peak asks, has the high level of consumption of dairy products in Icelandic society had any notable health impacts on the population? So I presume over the centuries, shall we say? That's a very good question. Yes. Um, in general, they uh, have very good teeth and very good bones, um, very good health into later age in general. Um, when you're looking at individual food products, of course, you can get yourself into a bit of trouble. For example, another food product which was much more commonly eaten if in the modern period up to the 1980s was uh, smoked lamb. And so because of the smoking, we had a bit of a, a, a blip in incidence, a little bit of an increase in incidence for stomach cancer, uh, for example. Um, so when you do look at uh, individual time periods like the medieval period, of course, it's very difficult on the joints and uh, very difficult for the teeth uh, with pre-modern food consumption. Or if you're looking at a specific product, for example, that lovely smoked lamb we all enjoy in the holidays, it can have effects on health which are negative or harder to see. Uh, but overall, modern Icelanders have very good calcium, very good uh, vitamin D, and all of that helps us out uh, very much because um, we don't get a lot of vitamin D. We are pretty much stuck in the grey for, for much of the year or even the total darkness, and we love it. <laughs> tell, tell us about it, Beth. Uh, <laughs> similar year in Shetland. Uh, thank you very much. I think Arne wanted to say something as well. Yes, I would like to say that skir is a very healthy product. I'm, I'm advertising here for skir like that. And uh, it has uh, no fat and uh, it's uh, very, really filling and, and, and a nice food source. And then we have the butter, uh, which was used to butter uh, dried fish. This was uh, what people ate instead of bread with butter every day. Yeah, again, uh, similar to, to here. Um, you mentioned uh, fermented butter. H how do you ferment butter? Well, it's called surt smear, uh, sour butter in Icelandic. Uh, it's fermented and, and uh, well, I'm not familiar with the, <laughs> with the method, actually, <laughs> but uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, um, it was kept in large quantities at the farms of the big people of the, the landowners and uh, even uh, like mountains, like like uh, haystacks. It was so, it kept so well. So uh, when there was famine, which was not uncommon, one could uh, resort to this, uh, but it was molded on the outside. I can tell you that. But uh, the method, uh, but are you familiar with the method? Yes, indeed I am. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple of things to support what you've just said, my dear. Um, first of all, yes, he is correct. There was a great store of dairy products in certain eras in Icelandic history. Uh, for example, like Valmal, um, it could be used as payment for certain things, payment of rent, 
of the land or payment of tithe to the church. So we have records uh, of church inventories that show that our northern bishopric uh, at Holof had a mountain of butter uh, of 25 tons by the 1500s. So uh, that's, a, that's a stunning amount of butter, of course. And then the next question is, how on earth were they keeping it all? So uh, what they would typically do is just salt the frick out of this butter and um, uh, wrap it in fish skin so that it would get very hard and uh, be very protected uh, using the salt to preserve from you know any bacteria or anything in the air that might be getting to it. And then so how they restore the butter then is um, they boil it. They put it in boiling water, they melt the butter, which means that the salt will dissolve into the, the water and then the milk fats can be um, sieved out and reconstituted into just the lovely butter that we want. Sounds nice. Fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, I've often wondered because they had um, butter uh, was also taxed uh, as a way of paying scat uh, here in Shetland as well, and uh, I always wondered what they what they did with it. So, thank you. Um, now we have time, I think, for uh, just at least one more question. Um, Simon's asked a few, but I think um, we'll move on from food. And Simon. Um, He's, he's interested in uh, how was widespread literacy achieved amongst ordinary Icelanders by 1780, which that seems to be, um, you know, compares favourably with, uh, well, he says the UK, but Scotland was doing quite well. So we compare with, uh, compares favourably with England. Um, so how was it actually achieved? Uh, this was achieved through the organisation of the church, which uh, visited every home, pre the priests visited every home, and they uh, checked if there were books in the home and if the housewife was able to read and write and to be able to read and uh, teach reading. Um, women were actually not encouraged to write. As you can see, the, the, nothing good, good might come out of that. And, uh, and uh, the, the authority thought at that time, and uh, and there was a campaign uh, which started in the middle of the 18th century by the church authorities. They did a survey of, of how many people could read and write, and uh, there was a difference between areas. The north and the east was mostly, most people there could read and write, but there was a problem in the south and west, and uh, especially in the fishing villages. So there was a campaign in the uh, 50 years between 1750 and 1800 uh, by the authorities, which was, I mean, uh, when the children were, were confirmed, the priests checked if they were uh, uh, able to read, and uh, if they weren't, they weren't confirmed. So they had a, they couldn't get into heaven. So they had a uh, sort of a reason to learn to read, and write. And so. Yeah, it was uh, a campaign on the part of the authorities. But before that, we have uh, uh, already from uh, about 1600, we have publishing publications of writ of printed sources uh, of print, uh, so not sources, printed books, catechisms, which were clearly intended for children to read. So it is earlier, and and, and um, we, uh, we don't know how it was in the Middle Ages, uh, for example, it any women write any sagas we don't know about that thank you very much and i think we'll draw the session to an end now thank you uh, to our three speakers the extremely interesting uh, talks and um, i think our understanding of the symbiotic relationship between husband and wife and the roles that both had to make life in iceland possible um, has been very clearly um, um, explained today. So thank you very much indeed.